morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Peggy DiAdamo, and I'm going to be the moderator for this particular webinar. I'd like to thank all of you for being here with us today. Um, just to tell you a bit about myself, I'm the Knowledge Management Advisor in the Global Health Bureau at USAID in the Office of Population and Reproductive Health. And I'm also the AOR, Agreement Officer's Representative for the Knowledge for Health Project. So I'm the manager of the project. So the presentation today will include four presentations, a brief one by myself. I'll start by sharing some background on why I think USAID is committed to the concept of content adaptation and, in fact, funding examples of content adaptation. I'll then pass my uh, baton over to my colleagues at Case and Health. Amy Lee will start out. Uh, Amy has over seven years of experience working in curriculum development, education, especially blended and distance learning and mobile learning. Nandini Jarajan, who manages the Global Health eLearning Center, which we'll be talking about today, and contributes to k for health work in the field and in digital health in particular. And Lisa Mwaikambo, who has over 10 years of work in knowledge management, working on USAID funded and, fun and projects funded by other donors in family planning, reproductive health, and HIV AIDS. Amy will start out by presenting the, the conceptualization or the reasoning behind developing a guide called Making Content Meaningful, while Nandini and Lisa will present some case studies that we hope will showcase how the framework in the guide was applied to the adaptation of content from the Global Health eLearning Center for an interactive voice response course in Kenya and for a mobile app in Ghana. After the presentations, we'll move into our Q&A. We would love your input and your engagement in this webinar, and we hope we can answer as many of your questions as time allows. <clears throat> so please use the chat box throughout the webinar, and especially during the Q&A. Um, also, the webinar will be recorded, and a link to the recording will be shared with all the participants afterwards. Um, so now I'd just like to say a few words about USAID's commitment to content adaptation. Next. Okay, why adapt content? Um, obviously, there are some, uh, some reasons why USAID thinks it's, an, it's a great idea to adapt existing content. One is it's efficient. It saves time and it saves money. Another is that the content that you adapt may be more likely to be accurate and of high quality especially if you're adapting content from a, a website that has been vetted by experts or that is based on evidence or that has been pre-tested and field tested. And finally, reuse. Reuse is one of the principles of digital development and it allows you to focus more on the parts of your intervention that may be um, more important to you as an as a implementer than on the actual content itself. So I would like to move on and say a few things about uh, examples of other websites or other content that's funded by USAID and that is really useful and adaptable. And the first one is the training resources package for family planning, which I personally have put a fair amount of effort into. This is a comprehensive set of training materials designed to support uh, kind of clinical training on family planning methods and reproductive health. It was developed by USAID, by WHO, and by um, UNFPA, and it's based on WHO guidance. So the Family Planning Handbook, the WHO Medical Eligibility Criteria, and the Selected Practice Recommendations. And now that those um, guidance documents have been updated, we're in the process of updating this, this, this resource um, so that it will be evidence-based. Contains curriculum components, uh, um, PowerPoint presentations, tools and exercises, everything you really need to design, implement, and evaluate a training program. It can be used in pre service and in service training, and is applicable for both the public and the private sector. And all of it is adaptable, can be changed, uh, can be added to, or you can delete from it. And parts of it, uh, all, the, all the PowerPoint presentations are also available in French. And you can see that on the slide. So 
So let me move on to the next tool that I would like to talk about, and that is ORB. It's a website that was created by Empowering Frontline Health Workers, and it's a really nice example of how uh, an organization can try to provide access to quality assured, openly licensed, so that means anyone can use it, content that can be used on mobile devices and shared among communities of practice, virtual communities. And a lot of this uh, is, is, um, is, is uh, interactive content, mobile content. ORB has three unique features. It brings into one place um, quality assured multimedia materials that have been produced by multiple organizations, not just by empowering, with a focus on maternal and child health. Also, you see family planning there. ORB also allows you to reuse and adapt quality assured training materials, again, saving you time and saving you money. And it also gives you access to a global network of organizations who are creating content. So you can share content that you create, you can review content created by other organizations. You can also share your experiences using the content. So please, if you use mobile, if you use this kind of multimedia content, please take a look at this website and consider using the content and creating your own content and sharing it through all of Next, I would like to talk about a different kind of a kit, a toolkit called the Policy Communication Toolkit, which is fairly new. It's created by the PACE Project, which is a project in my office that works on policy and advocacy and is managed by Population Reference Bureau. And Population Reference Bureau has been doing policy and advocacy training for many years. And they finally pulled together in one place this, this great toolkit, which includes um, <clears throat> information on new topics, such as how to use social media for research and policy, and policy communication for budget negotiations and accountability, as well as topics that people have been working on for quite a, quite a while. For example, how do you communicate uh, research findings to policymakers in a way that helps them understand what kind of policy needs to be created, how to frame clear, actionable policy messages, and how to communicate those messages through briefs, presentations, interviews, data visualizations, social media, and other media. Um, the toolkit compiles more than 30 years of PRB's experience into one accessible online format and you can select and customize the, the materials and the sessions to meet your own needs, whether it's a two-hour workshop or a two-week training. So if you're going to be doing any policy advocacy work, I would recommend that you take a look at this new toolkit. And finally, I would just like to say a word about Mobile for Reproductive Health, um, which also called M4RH. This is a, an automated, interactive, on-demand, SMS service, text message service, that provides simple, accurate information on reproductive health on a range of topics. It was developed in 2009 and has been piloted in Kenya, Tanzania, and used in other countries. And it was one of the first services that took advantage of the, of the fact that there were so many cell phones uh, available and being used in, uh, in countries where we work put accurate information into the hands directly of people who actually look for it and need it. Since then, it has expanded its content and has been adopted and adapted by organizations around the world, similar to MAMA, which I won't be talking about, but it's another example. The reason I bring up M4RH uh, is that they have also developed their own content adaptation framework, which you can find on the website. And if you're going to be developing content yourself, it's definitely worth taking a look at their framework because it really incorporates iterative communication and testing, um, making sure that the target audience understands the information and that it meets their needs. And it will also be mentioned as one of the case studies um, in the K for Health part of the presentation. So I'm finished talking and I'm going to move on and give the baton to Amy Lee. We will introduce Cape for Health and talk about the guide, and then we'll hear from Lisa and Nandini. Thank you. 
Great. Thanks, Peggy, for that overview. Uh, it's great to hear about USAID's various efforts to developing learning content. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Thanks for joining us. As Peggy mentioned, for my portion of the presentation, I'll be providing a brief overview of the K for Health project, our various activities that led to the development of the content adaptation guide, and lastly, I'll review the guide's adaptation framework. So K for Health is the flagship knowledge management project of USAID's Bureau for Global Health, Office of Population and Reproductive Health. K for Health is implemented by the Johns Hopkins Center for Communication Programs, FHI 360, InterHealth International, and Management Sciences for Health. Um, our mission is that we envision a social knowledge sharing revolution in which global uh, health program managers and service providers at all levels around the world can collaborate with and learn from each other as well as adapt and use family planning and global health knowledge to build stronger health systems. And we work towards this mission by um, gathering, curating, producing accurate, up-to-date knowledge and platforms. We use KM approaches, we provide access to evidence, connecting health workers to knowledge, implementing digital health solutions, working with partners to strengthen their internal capacity and health systems, as well as conduct research on KM interventions. In an effort to connect health workers to knowledge, the Knowledge for Health Project also manages the Global Health eLearning Center, or GHEL. So GHEL offers free access to now over uh, free access to now over 85 free e-learning courses on a variety of global health and international development topics. To date, more than 170,000 learners from all countries around the globe are registered on the site and have earned over 300,000 course completion certificates. Um, we generally support the development of new e-learning courses on GEGL and other platforms as a way to build capacity within organizations. And we often get requests from users or other organizations to adapt our GEGL content. Our content is licensed under the terms described in our privacy policy on the site. And basically it just states that if you adapt a course content, it's okay as long as the original source is attributed. Based on our experiences with GAGL, working with course authors who are interested in using the courses as part of their organizational capacity building and training, K for Health to develop the blended learning guide for those who are interested in exploring ways of how to incorporate the courses into their existing capacity building portfolios. So in the blended learning guide, we offer guidance on how to design a blended learning intervention as well as provide recommendations for various modes of trainings from face-to-face, -face, online, and then of course blended. About two years ago, K for Health embarked on developing a content adaptation guide, which is meant to be a companion guide for the blended learning one. And part of the reason is because we recognize that there's an abundance of openly accessible health content, um, and, but health content is not sufficient by itself. It's important to provide it in the appropriate context and the language of the people who will use it in order for it to be useful. And you make existing open health content useful by adapting it. As Peggy mentioned um, during her portion of the, adapt, uh, of the presentation, we believe that adaptation is both evidence-based and innovative. You take content that's proven in one context and you apply them in another. We're quite happy to announce that the guide is now available in both English and French.
generally speaking, um, when we talk of adaptation, there are three main types. So you can adapt content by making it appropriate to a specific local or cultural context. You can adapt content by making it available in the local language, or you can adapt content by making it available through a different delivery method or technology. But often content adaptation involves the combination of the three that I mentioned. During our literature search for this guide, we found a number of extremely uh, useful and available frameworks, including that from M4RH, which Peggy mentioned during her portion. But we found that these frameworks, um, many outline adaptation as it relates to introducing technology, and we weren't able to find one that explicitly looked at key considerations when repurposing content. So as a result, the guide that we have created outlines a framework with key steps and questions accompanied by activity sheets and examples to guide users in making informed decisions in the content adaptation process. Uh, the framework is divided into three phases. So the before phase is the formative stage when you understand and scan the audience, their needs, and the existing content that's available. During is the implementation stage when you design and deliver the adapted content. And after is the evaluation stage when you evaluate and learn from the experience to develop ideas for next steps. And later in this webinar, my colleagues Lisa and Nandini will highlight two specific case studies which will guide you through these steps in much more detail. Great. Um, and in the guide, we highlight five different case studies that demonstrate these combinations of adaptation, adapting for context, adapting for language, and adapting for delivery method. So this table shows in what ways and from what original content the final product was adapted. On the left-hand side, you'll see the format of the original content. So you can see the original content from global and local curricula guides to GHEL courses, health wikis, as well as video content. In the middle three columns, you'll see how the content was adapted. And finally, on the far right, you'll see what the final product was. So we have mLearning, SMS, and as well as video. Um, I want to take this opportunity to give a big thank you to FHI 360, Grameen, Hesperian, and Medical AIDS Film who contributed these case studies. But in this webinar, we will focus specifically on the CHN on-the-go M learning application, as well as the IVR, or the interactive voice response. We selected these two because they're specific to adapting GHEL e-learning courses, and GHEL is what we manage at K for Health. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna pass it on to my colleague Nandini, who will talk about one of the first case studies. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much, Amy, for that wonderful um, overview of the guide and um, the framework. Today I'll be talking about, sorry, next. <laughs> Today I'll be talking about um, the interactive voice response uh, content adaptation activity that we did in, that Cape for Health did in Kenya. Um, um, so, in 2013, we attended the um, eLearning Africa conference, and in talking to many of the attendees, we learned that um, a popular um, format for delivering content was using interactive voice response, or essentially delivering um, content via audio recordings directly to people's personal, personal mobile devices as, a, um, as, an, as an easy, and um, and simple way for um, f for their audience to to hear and learn um, new technical information. 
Um, at the same time, K for Health's partner, Interhealth International, had just completed an interactive voice response pilot test in Senegal, where they used um, where they used family planning. They delivered family planning training to 20 participants using the space education uh, model. Um, in doing our own scan of uh, of countries that would uh, be great for this sort of implementation, Kenya was selected as our intervention country. It has a long history of supporting online learning and other new learning platforms. It also has a national continued medical education strategy and primarily uses English as um, English in professional settings. Um, we also partnered with Kenya Medical Training College in Kitui um, as that campus is, their, is KMTC Center for Family Planning Excellence and we relied a lot on Interhealth Kenya's office for both IT development support and for administrative and logistical support. The, the instructional design method that we used for the IVR training was based on the space education model. This model is developed at Harvard University and has been proven and is a proven method in almost 20 randomized controlled trials. Essentially what um, this training is getting at is when you are taking a class or taking a, a training or workshop, at the end of that class, the, what we'll call the initial learning event, your knowledge retention is basically at 100%. Immediately after completing the class or the initial learning event, um, your knowledge retention starts to drop, decrease until about, and then eventually around like 30 days, your knowledge retention will be at around like 20%. So what the space education or uh, reinforcement training model attempts to do is at spaced intervals, you introduce a reinforcement training that over time will keep your knowledge retention at a higher level. So, um, for this particular case study, we're focusing more on the before section of the content adaptation framework. So in order to understand like what content would be necessary or, or appropriate for both the space education, instructional design, and for the Kenya audience that we were working with, um, we, we talked to the KMTC uh, lecturers and the nurse supervisor at the district hospital of Kitui and when talking to um, the college we understood that they essentially wanted all of their staff and their students to have a basic understanding of family planning and then when talking to the district hospital they wanted, um, they, in, in addition to having a basic understanding of family planning and reproductive health, they also wanted their nurses who provide family planning services to have a refresher on family planning counseling. So we looked at the, uh, at the Global Healthy Learning courses as um, for what courses would be, would kind of satisfy both of these learning and training needs. Um, and finally, we selected the Family Planning 101 and the Family Planning Counseling courses. These courses were, we enrolled 222 participants and these, and all the participants completed um, offline copies, rather like paper copies of the Family Plan, of both of these e-learning courses and completed the final exam and the baseline knowledge assessment. Then at about at least six weeks, um, after all the participants completed the courses, we introduced the IVR training. And the IVR training was um, a selection of 10 questions from both the e-learning courses final exams. So when selecting these uh, the content and the and the questions for the IVR training. We worked with uh, Interhealth Kenya staff to and our local K for Health consultant to review the content to make sure that it was relevant. The, con the technical content in the trainings was relevant to the students and health providers enrolled in the training and 
that the language, meaning like the vocabulary and um, and jargon and and all that, was uh, was easy to understand by the audience. Next, we had um, we had a local staff member to record the 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 text content. And this was really important because we wanted to make sure that both the accent was familiar to the the um, the accent and the cadence and the rhythm of how someone would listen to uh, someone in that country was uh, was similar to the audiences. So it was really about both the context and the culture in that sense. Um, in order for this kind of activity to be successful, the local stakeholder engagement and partnerships were absolutely critical. This would not have been possible without the support and involvement of, K of Kenya Medical Training College in Kitui, the District Hospital of Kitui, and Intrahealth International in, in Kenya. Um, this activity used uh, the participants' personal mobile phones, and I would say that that is really like where the biggest like well, technical and content challenge was some of the participants had older, mo old, much older mobile phones, and as a result, the audio content was um, wasn't as high of a quality um, the, the, for their phones. Um, the the recordings themselves, um, folks with more with newer models said that the the voice came in crisp and it was easy to understand, but on older like feature phones or um, basic models, uh, sometimes it would be a little muffled uh, or distant sounding. And so now I'm going to pass it over to my colleague Lisa Moicambo, who will be talking about the next case study. Thanks, Nandini, and thanks everyone for joining us today to talk about this experience in the content adaptation guide itself. So as Nandini laid out kind of the before phase, um, the Ghana case study that I'm going to be presenting focuses more on the during and after phase. Next. So we're specifically going to speak to the adaptation of global health e-learning content for a mobile application that was developed for Android phones. Um, although GHL can be accessed via phones, the website's mobile responsive, it requires an internet connection, which can still be a problem in a number of areas in which we work. So this case study talks largely about the collaboration um, of k for health with Ghana Health Services and Grameen Foundation under the Concern Worldwide Care Community Hub Project. Um, the Care Community Hub Project really sought to improve community health nurses' job satisfaction and um, motivation and thus forth retention um, in rural settings in Ghana. Um, the, project itself, I'm not going to speak to necessarily, I'm going to try to zone in just on this one content adaptation piece, but at the end of the um, presentation, I provide a number of resources that can give you more information around the entire um, project. Next. So before we jump into the during phase, um, I should mention that Grameen Foundation worked closely with a design firm to conduct a needs assessment and user research. The results of that research kind of served as their before, if you will, and it identified five drivers and roadblocks to CHN's community health nurses' self-reported retention and job satisfaction. The factors that contributed to greater job satisfaction included feeling valued, recognition, access to information and tools, learning about new advances in health, and the ability to connect to a super, super supportive sorry, peer network. Unsurprisingly, CHNs felt demotivated by the opposite factors, a lack of appreciation for hard work, limited resources, a lack of advancement opportunities, disconnection from family and friends, and disrespectful treatment or bullying at work. 
So the, the research or the information that was collected in the before stage really helped to set the stage for the during phase, which is all about implementation and really contains the main process of ad adaptation. So how will, you in, in, how will your information be delivered? What needs to be transformed and how will this be done? So as a result of the findings, um, Grameen sought to build upon an open source mobile application to provide access to open learning resources such as decision making tools like job aids, e-learning courses, and general wellness quotes to address the demo demotivating factors but also to build upon the existing motivating factors. So the resulting mobile application, um, which was called CHNs on the go, um, contain multiple modules um, and today we're going to focus really on the learning module or the learning center um, in which we adapted and deployed GHL content to address CHN's express need for learning about what's new in health and restricted opportunities for career progression. Next. So step six within the during phase really is about the repurposing of content. And in addition to the user research that was conducted, Grameen Foundation worked closely with Ghana Health Services to review the CHN's terms of reference and various protocols defining service, their service provision. Based on that review, Grameen shared with k for health kind of at least in terms of the family planning um, services, like what methods are actually available in Ghana, what can CHNs provide versus refer, and then the k for health team, we reviewed our courses on GHL and kind of picked what we felt could map um, content-wise to some of those um, provision areas, and then we pulled out specifically the provider-specific content. As you may know, GHL courses content-wise serves a very broad audience of not only providers, but policymakers, program managers. Um, so we really need to look through the content to pull out what we felt was the most relevant from a service provider perspective. Once we provided that um, content, and in some cases we also had to kind of further synthesize um, or rewrite certain concepts to make them more um, understandable and maybe less jargony in certain cases. Um, we then shared the content with Grameen who reviewed the content with Ghana Health Services to ensure it, the content's relevance and confirm that it's in line with the local health protocols. And during that stage, um, any kind of adaptation that took place was largely around how to operationalize some of those key concepts for the Ghana actual service delivery um, system and health system. In addition, that's where um, the identification or replacement of photos also took place. So in, in, since GHL is really for global audience, we had case studies um, that are not just Ghana specific. We have imagery that's not just Ghana specific. So they try to make those changes so that the CHNs could really relate to what they were reading via the visuals as well. In addition, we made sure to remove any kind of unnecessary details such as global stats. Um, it was determined that if statistics were going to be presented that they'd be Ghana specific, um, but even in those cases that wasn't always um, as desirable as what we found. Um, so what we largely found from this experience um, is that the review process was a very collaborative effort um, between a number of departments of the reproductive and child health divisions of the Ghana Health Services, um, Grameen, um, Concern Worldwide, k for health to make sure that the content suited um, the context that the project was serving. Um, and what we found was about 8% of the global GHL content was relevant as is. So it was that 20% that really required adaptation. So just as within any kind of um, technology intervention, digital health intervention, the idea of testing and iterative is very important. So is it with content. And just as the mobile app was um, 
rolled out in phases to help in the testing and improvements um, cycle, so was the content. So when the app was initially rolled out, it was rolled out with just the family planning course content in the learning module. And then at the second phase, we also included the MNCH learning from that experience. Next. So a key step to, is not only knowing where your audience is and where they kind of get information, and, but also what motivates them. So in this case, since um, the issue of lack of opportunities for um, career progression was at, at large play, we looked at what could be done to make the um, online, or in this case, the M learning courses um, accredited so that they would count towards CHN's um, renewal of licenses. So Grameen engaged Ghana's Nursing and Midwifery Council to see if they can get the adapted open learning courses um, count as continuing professional development credit. In order to obtain accreditation, we had to put in place a second level skills assessment beyond the course final exam to ensure that students who passed a course on the app actually read and understood the material. So um, one of the requirements of the council, the regulatory body, is like um, that knowledge gains is not sufficient. They also want to see skills improvement. So working with the council and the Ghana Health Services, um, k for health and Grameen developed scenario-based practical questions that the CHN supervisors um, would administer in person at the district or sub-district level. So the evaluator who would be the district or sub-district supervisor, such as the district public health nurse or the head of reproductive and child health unit at the sub-district health center, would ask questions that would ensure that the user understood how to apply the content that they read in a practical situation that um, didn't always follow the script of the course, per se. And as far as we are aware, this is the very first M learning courses that the Nurse and Midwifery Council in Ghana has ever approved for accreditation. So I'm going to briefly talk about the after phase. Um, I should state that in addition to the courses following how, the adapted courses following how GHL um, website platform works that a learner has to pass with an 85% or higher the final exam. That same um, standard was applied to the adapted courses on the mobile app. Um, so we could look at that as, you know, were the learning objectives met? Um, but in addition to that piece, JSI conducted an external evaluation of the entire CHN on the Go app. And um, what we found from that was that the Learning Center itself continued to be one of the most accessed and popular um, modules of the app. However, the interaction with the modules did decrease over time. To date, um, the 14 GHL FP and MNCH courses were adapted and deployed on mobile devices to 220 CHNs and 55 district supervisors in the five um, pilot districts um, in Ghana. And from when it was first rolled out in July 2014 to September 2015, uh, CHNs successfully completed 240, I'm sorry, 234 courses. Um, so although there was only 14 courses, there was, um, they registered extreme popularity with 234 being completed. We found that the MNCH courses tended to be more popular and demand for them was higher. And that was interesting since those were available for a shorter period of time since those were the second version, the, they were available at the second kind of rollout phase. Um, but that also shows the importance of the content um, in terms of it's relevant to their work and the counseling that they tended to do more of. Um, we found that um, more than half of those who passed the final exam did so on their first attempt. This finding, we weren't able to explore further if this was an issue, a uh, technical issue or connectivity issue in terms of the mobile app, or if this was an issue with the content itself and potential difficulty or newness um, or digital literacy issues or language issues, we weren't really sure. But we found that people were definitely self-motivating um, because they 
attempted the courses multiple times and before they um, passed and at that time we hadn't already received the accreditation so that was pretty awesome. The Grameen Foundation and its partner Concern Worldwide are working on scaling up CHN on the go. They are in discussions with GHS um, to scale it up across the country. It is currently being considered as an add-on information education and communication IEC app to a GHS developed data collection app to provide health IEC materials to GHS staff with the support of UNICEF. In one of the pilot regions, preparations are underway to scale up the app across the region beyond just the two pilot districts. And the content is also being scaled up beyond the Care Community Hub projects, um, five districts through Japigo's M Learning Project for nurses and midwifery students. So key lessons. Um, in a certain ways, they reflect also what Nandini has outlined from the IVR Kenya case study. The engagement with local stakeholders at multiple levels of the health system are crucial. Um, although time consuming, they're extremely important to make sure that your content is relevant. And also as a result, I think it helps with pr promotion of it and the, um, the ins ensuring demand. Um, the alignment to country protocols, um, the fact that making sure that the content is relevant to the job responsibilities, um, that visually, so in Nandini's case, like the, the audio was important that it reflected the Kenyan context. In this case, with it being really just text and imagery, it was really important that the imagery and visuals reflect the local context. Um, the iterative approach of not only testing the app itself, but also kind of spacing how we rolled out content was useful um, in terms of feedback. And then considering incentives, um, I don't think can be understated. Um, often we think if we just produce something and put it out there, that's sufficient, but we learn more and more that people um, who lack information, sometimes it's just also that they're bombarded or don't know where to start. So having some kind of accreditation or a way to filter to know that this information is um, reputable um, is really important. So for those who are interested in learning more information about CHN on the go, there are a number of resources here that I'd like to share that um, Concern Worldwide shared with us, as well as um, we co-authored um, a peer-reviewed journal article with Grameen um, about this experience. You can also find some of these resources um, in the handout section of the um, webinar if you look at the right of your screen in the control panel. Thank you very much for your time. We're really looking forward to um, hearing your questions and um, discussing opportunities for uh, content adaptation more with you. I'm going to turn the mic over to Peggy. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Nandini and Amy. That was great. Um, so if you haven't put your question into the question box, now's the time to do that. Um, and also take a look at the handouts that Lisa mentioned. There are four handouts there that you can click on and download that will give you more information about the, the Ghana activity as well as the blended learning guide and the French and English versions of making content meaningful. And we have about 15 minutes for questions. So I would like to start with a question of my own uh, while I give other people a chance to put something in. Um, when you think about the before, the during, and the after stages of, of the process that you've created, can you speak a little bit about which stage is most important, if that's possible, and which stage takes most time? Thanks, Peggy. I think I'll take that question. This is Lisa Moicambo. Um, I think from our point of view, it's really important to know the training needs that you're trying to address. Um, now, whether or not that needs to be done in a formal assessment versus um, an informal approach, I think that is determined by the project and how close um, 
the organization already has uh, relationships with the stakeholders that they're um, hoping to assist um, and kind of build capacity with. The, what we found um, is often the during uh, phase can take the most time, um, largely because of the need to engage so many stakeholders. And we really, um, it's not that it's the most challenging stage, but just being mindful of the various stakeholders, time commitments, and trying to gather all the appropriate people around the table or figuring out how exactly to do the review process of the content, um, that is often timely, um, takes time largely just for scheduling and making sure you have the right people around the table. Great, thank you very much. It would, it would be great to hear though from others um, if, if they follow a similar approach or not, if they find um, their experience is different and if certain phases actually from their experience take more time or are more challenging. Okay. Nandini, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about the findings of the IVR intervention. We heard a little bit about the Grameen um, Android app, but we didn't really hear much from you about what the outcome was of the IVR activity in Kenya. So can you speak a little bit more about that? Sure, absolutely. Um, so during the evaluation stage, we looked at um, we looked at the usability of the platform itself, meaning like what um, whether the participants actually enjoyed using the platform and enjoyed that um, space education style of instructional design. Um, and uh, we also looked at sort of like the participant engagement with the IVR platform as well, meaning like the passive data that the platform tracks. And then we also finally looked at like the knowledge retention. Um, for the usability, we did a usability survey and we did three focus group discussions. And essentially what we found out was that overall the participants really enjoyed um, receiving training on their phones, the audio recordings. Um, and they also liked the instructional design of it. Particularly what they liked was um, that that they were able to take the course at when and in their words was when in, it was convenient and it was simple to use and they were able to to do the training at their at their own time like when they were free to do it. Um, they also really liked being able to to hear the questions and sort of like try and remember and use their own sort of memory bank to to respond to the questions and then afterwards um, we provide like the full um, question response and feedback and like explanation of that question and they really enjoyed listening to that. They also actually really enjoyed the the offline um, copies of the e-learning course and many of them kept that version as a resource that they still kind of like use um, when um, talking about family plan and reproductive health to either a client or to a friend. Um, from the participant engagement, so while 222 participants had been enrolled on um, the platform, um, only about, uh, I believe, 97 actually completed the full training and about 125 uh, dropped off after uh, completing about like 50%. Um, still, the people who completed the training, they spent an average of um, of about, sorry, I don't have it right in front of me, but they spent an average of about uh, 20 days on the platform and um, about 5.9 minutes during each call, whereas the folks who did not complete the IVR training spent an average about like 8 to 10 days and then spent about like 3.5 minutes on the platform. Um, a big reason why people did not complete the IVR was um, because their mobile phones, a lot of the students had very old versions of the phones, so they had a hard time hearing the audio. Um, but that was like a, a big reason in general. Um, overall, with the questions themselves and the content itself, it was about new, it was new content for most of the participants and um, and some of them, like about half of them found it simple and easy questions, and about half of them found it to be a little bit challenging, which is a kind of uh, a good mix. Um, finally, with like the knowledge retention, um, 
comparing the folks who completed the full IVR training and the folks who did uh, who dropped off uh, before completing it, um, we did find that uh, overall there the peop the we did like a baseline assessment and an, and an endline assessment, knowledge assessment, and comparing the two scores between the, the, the two groups, people who had completed the full training scored about um, two to three points higher on the endline assessment than the, um, than the baseline, than the control group, meaning like the folks who did not complete the IVR. So it's possible that this uh, instructional design um, has some effect on long-term knowledge retention, but we'd have to do um, more research and study to see if that's actually true or not. And thank you, Nandini. <clears throat> I have a question from uh, someone who's on the line asking, are there any guidelines around permissions and or attributions for adapted content? Or is this only determined on a case-by-case -case basis by the authors of the original content? What's your advice on that? So um, this is Lisa. I'd like to take that one, if you don't mind. Um, the Global Health eLearning Center, we can share with you the privacy um, policy. Um, it's right on the platform, so we'll share a URL for, for that with you for that. Um, but largely because GHL was developed in 2005 before Creative Commons became as understood and popular as it is now, you can kind of think of um, the content on GHL as kind of under a Creative Commons attribution. So you can adapt content. Um, we ask that there's an acknowledgement as to where the source came from and that we also kind of have a disclaimer that we as USAID and k for health aren't responsible for keeping the adapted content up to date um, just because that becomes challenging in its own rights. Um, so the content once, and our content, it, it's always good to know though because I think um, so many course authors from different implementing agencies contribute a lot of time to synthesizing and developing these courses. So the more we can find out that they're being used and in what manner, that would just be wonderful because I think that's very helpful to the course authors. It's very motivating. We do want this content to get out there. We just cannot host um, on GHL adapted content. So we can start to think about linking out to it or coming up with a way to acknowledge that this also exists in a different language and whatnot um, or for a specific audience or context, but um, we wouldn't be able to create a course um, that is specific to just one country or one um, health cadre and host it on GHL, just given GHL's um, focus as being really a global resource. Um, this is Peggy. I also wanted to add that I think Creative Commons is pretty much the only example of kind of guidelines that can be used about adapting or using content, reusing content. And you'll find that on some websites. For example, Orb, I think, has um, uses Creative Commons. Uh, the TRP, for example, just says, yes, you can use all these materials, do whatever you want with them. It's great if you if you give us credit, but that's not even necessarily necessary. And, and on that website, we have tried to link to um, adapt, adaptations that have been done by other organizations. For example, you know, they have a specific audience or they may want to add content that isn't in the TRP. So if you go on there and, and look at the blog, you'll see examples of other adapted content. And this and, is, so, oh, go ahead, Amy. Uh, this is Amy. Something else in addition to Creative Commons licenses, if things are marked as public domain, that's also uh, adaptable. We actually have an appendix in the content adaptation guide that gives you an overview of the permission policies for repurposing content. So you can definitely refer to that of our guide. Great, thank you. Yep. Okay, we have another question asking, have, have any of you ever developed content for illiterate populations? And if you have, can you talk a little bit about that? Because that's a challenge. Yeah. Um, so actually, we one of the first uh, 
forays for K for Health doing um, content adaptation was actually we worked a little bit with Demagi in India, and they had uh, an act uh, a project where they were working with frontline health workers in North India um, who provide family planning, reproductive health uh, counseling services to. Um, their rural communities, and they needed um, content both for like text and audio, um, and then they would um, then they would translate it, uh, translate that English content for the frontline health workers. And um, the text wasn't the wasn't really that effective for this population because not all of them could read, or um, it's really hard to 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 sort of like talk about the really technical content of family planning in um, in like essentially one sentence. But what we found using, which rather what Dimaki found and kind of gave us instructions for, um, was that the audio recordings kind of allow you um, about three to five minutes and about like 250 words, like 500 words, to really explain like a concept and, um, and in like the language and in the style and cadence that um, people do talk about it in. So um, I would actually give more credit to like Dimagi in this in this particular example where they really did a lot of um, initial research to like understand their population, understand the literacy um, limitations of their population, and figure out like a solution that really works for them um, and one that they really like and enjoy as well. Thank you. We have about four minutes left. I have one more question comment, which is interesting, came in from Pam Bolton of, of um, who worked on the concern world, concern activity in Ghana. And she says, um, with Care Community Hub, concern made extensive use of design thinking to develop empathy and deep understanding of the nurses' daily realities, challenges, and fulfillments. Their findings are that these approaches led to strong buy-in and uptake of the smartphone app by the nurses. Have, have you encountered other projects that took this approach? And if so, what results did they attribute to the use of design thinking? Thanks, Pam. Anybody want to take that one? <laughs> that one's a bit hard because it, it um... I don't know if I can pinpoint or give just uh, a specific example. I mean, I know with um, there's a faster to zero project that's um, taking place in Uganda um, to help further, like leverage technology to help further or um, the elimination of mother to child transmission of HIV. And I know they plan to do like a user centered design approach. And I know that there's a lot of popularity in user centered design. Um, I believe it's, Nanjani, please correct me if I'm wrong, maybe IDEO has a course that has picked up a lot of popularity um, around human centered design. But to say that I'm familiar with the evidence based or like the number of projects that are using it and its effectiveness, I can't say. It It wouldn't surprise us um, to hear it, that the evidence would be very strong because we really do believe um, that the before phase, the making sure that you're developing content that's meeting your audience needs and therefore engaging your audience to know what their needs are um, and then making the content feel relevant, um, whether it's through the audio, the visuals, um, we we know that that will have more buy-in, I guess, from just historic experience, but I don't know if I can speak to um, the actual evidence or point out specific projects. Yeah, I I would say as well, I mean, I've, um, I personally haven't been involved on any HCD um, activities, um, and there is a course. It's like a very, it's actually a nice collaborative course that's um, done by I want to say Udacity and Acumen on human centered design um, that I believe is free, like and, and given like twice a year if anyone is interested in learning more about it. Um, one thing, I, a lot of the presentations and reading that I've done on human centered design seems to be really effective with youth populations um, and um, and training around for that particular like cohort or audience. Hey, thank you. 
Uh, I just want to say there are more questions that we're not going to get to answer, but we will keep them and we will make sure that um, Amy, Nandini, and Lisa respond to you um, individually offline for the questions that we were not able to answer. Um, as we wrap up, I'd like to thank the three of you um, and Ados at IBP for your enthusiasm for organizing this webinar. Ados in particular has been really outstandingly helpful and I would like to thank you. Thank all of you for joining us. We appreciate your interest in the topic and we hope that you find the guide useful. Please reach out directly to any one of us <clears throat> on the K4Health team or even to me if you'd like to share your feedback on the guide. If you might have another case study, that would be a great one to present online. Or if you have ideas about potential opportunities for collaborating around the use of the guide or for collaborating on the larger scale. As mentioned earlier, there's, there will be a link to the recording and we'll also share those other links that were in the presentations and in the handout section. Uh, there'll be a survey as, of, as well and I, we'd appreciate it if you would fill it out. And thank you all for participation and for your great questions. <clears throat>